Let me begin by welcoming everybody to the Future Trends Forum. I'm glad to see you all here. Uh, I'd like to introduce the program, but first I'll introduce myself. I'm Brian Alexander, I'm the forum's creator, chief cat herder, and host. And for the next hour, we'll be exploring the future of higher education. Now, one little, one further note. Uh, today represents a slight shift of our programming. For the past two months, like the rest of the world, we've been extremely concerned with what's going on with the global pandemic. And for week after week, we've had session after session, spectacular guest after spectacular guest, here to help us think through the impact of COVID-19 on higher education. And we've cut this through numerous, numerous angles, everything from academic labor to physical safety to online teaching. And we're gonna keep doing that. But after we polled all of you, we got the impression that you'd like to have some of our programming return to its previous content, that is to focus on everything else that impacts the future of colleges and universities. So right now, we're starting to do that. In fact, for the next couple of weeks, I'll show you at the end of today's session, we'll be touching on other topics as well. So if you'd like to keep up with COVID-19, we'll be touching it. We'll definitely be talking about it. And if I or the guests don't raise the topic, please, this is your forum. You can raise that topic right away. But we'll also be covering other fields as well. Now, our guest today um, is a splendid writer, uh, an economist, who has written a really, really important book on income inequality and what it means for society. And we'd like to bring Jonathan up here in order to talk about what this means for higher education. How do colleges and universities intersect with income inequality? As income and wealth inequality rise, does higher education play a role in accelerating that rise? In other words, do colleges and universities widen the gaps across society? Or does higher education continue to play the role that it did in the middle of the 20th century and try to narrow those gaps and try and produce a middle class? Now, there's a lot you can learn about Jonathan, um, all kinds of wonderful things about him, including the fact that he is the chief economist for Gallup, so the world's leading polling organization. Uh, he also has a beard which is going on, so I have to naturally respect him uh, as a result of that. And you can buy a copy of his new book, Republic of Equals. There's a button in the bottom left corner of the screen for that. So let me just first of all welcome you. Hello, Jonathan. Greetings. Hello. Oh, I'm really glad to see you. I'm really glad you could make it. How are you doing today? It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm doing very well, thank you. Uh, social distancing here in Washington, D.C. And um, as yeah. things are going as, as well as they can under the circumstances. Well, you and I both work in professions where we can do a lot of work without uh, any social contact whatsoever. Indeed. It's like they design these for introverts, um, I think. Um, so uh, there's so many ways I can introduce you to people, Jonathan. There's so many questions I could ask. The, the first one I want to ask is, what does the chief economist at Gallup do? Well, it's, it depends on what's going on, uh, because one thing that we try to do at Gallup more generally is solve pressing problems to business leaders and to, uh, as well as problems facing the general public. And so we do polling on the, you know, the hottest topics, the most important issues. So lately I've been doing a lot of writing and research on COVID-19, trying to figure out amongst other things, how much economic damage uh, the virus has caused and uh, document uh, what I think are the, the appropriate policy responses to, to addressing that. So I've been writing both on, on Gallup's homepage, a little bit with the New York Times, where I'm a frequent contributor to the, the Upshot column there that some of you may be familiar with, mm -hmm. and also on the Brookings homepage, where uh, we've been doing some comparisons of how the United States has been doing relative to other countries in terms of its economic policy responses, its reliance on unemployment insurance and things like that. When I'm not, uh, you know, before the, this crisis, I was uh, doing work on, on a variety of projects. One was measuring the quality of jobs in the United States. That was a, a large survey project that uh, I got a chance to, to work on with the Gates Foundation, Lumina Foundation, and Amidiar Network. And we surveyed 10,000 people and asked a variety of questions about uh, the quality of their job and, and the different mm. dimensions that matter to them mm. and how that relates to other aspects of their their work and, and non-work life. Wow, what a great project. 
Thanks. I, I, I found it uh, to be to very, very useful. And, and we've got the data, uh, the publicly, we've got uh, the microdata on our, on our website. So anyone who, who is so inclined can, can, can play around with that data, develop their own research and uh, you know, writing around it. I'd be happy to share that link. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you. Um, it's kind of a golden age for inequality research. Uh, your project, uh, folks like uh, Saez, Piketty. Unfortunately, that's that's true. Uh, as as I document in my book, and is well known for people who follow the work of uh, Saez and Piketty and Zuckman. Uh, U.S. income inequality is extraordinarily high and has been rising over the last forty years. Uh, so now we're at roughly twenty percent of income going to the richest one percent of, of Americans, and that's up from about 10% in 1980. Uh, which is really a huge, huge difference and not a long, not a long period of time. Um, looking forward, before we, before we dive into your book and into the topic itself, what do you anticipate spending most of your time on over the next year? And that is both kind of practices, what are you going to be working on, and, and also the ideas. What are, are you going to continue to plow the furrow of income inequality or will you do something else? Well, I'd, li I'd, I'd like to continue to do research on income inequality. Some of the, the, the projects that I had anticipated working on or have been kind of put on hold as a result of COVID-19. And I'll be looking at uh, the effects and consequences, uh, how they vary by, by income, by occupation, by race uh, here in the United States, and then how our response uh, and how the relief programs available to us are, are faring relative to the types of packages that we've seen in European countries, as well as Australia and New Zealand. Mm. And uh, yeah, hopefully shed some light on what, you know, what kind of policies would be most useful right now and, um, and, and, and provide some greater certainty as to what we might expect in the next few months in terms of economic recovery. Well, thank you. Um, and good luck with that work. We need it done. Um, and we'll look forward to it. Uh, friends, I have a couple of questions uh, based on uh, Jonathan's writing, but I just want to let you know that um, this is the time when you can start asking your own questions. And uh, we already have one question, which I won't do the favor of displaying because it's a terrible joke. Uh, someone asks, when does a joke become a dad joke? When it's apparent. But I'm, I'm not going to flash that on the screen. That's, that's too awful. Um, the first question I'd like to ask right now is, wh what do you – what are the ways in which higher education now reduces income inequality? How does it mitigate that problem? Well, we know from decades of research in labor economics that uh, getting a bachelor's degree or a graduate degree, even getting some post-secondary credentials short of a bachelor's degree, not just associate's degree, but uh, you know, certifications, things like that, all those things contribute to how much money someone can earn in the labor market. Okay. And there's a very strong relationship between years of education uh, and, and earnings and degree, uh, the acquisition of degree and earnings. Uh, so in it depends on when you think about how that plays out in the labor market it, it's it's actually rather complicated because on the one hand uh intergenerational mobility issues uh would if, if you're thinking about it through that point of view then then people who whose parents do not go to college who go to college and then and and and, and benefit from those earnings advantages are moving up and that's narrowing the income distribution from what it otherwise would be. And certainly there's been a lot of that happening. Educational attainment in the United States has, has increased dramatically over the course of the 20th and now into the 21st century, slowed down somewhat, uh, but uh, the trend has been one of, of rising levels of, of education. So if you think of it from that point of view, we went from a, a society where very few people were working as professionals uh, and, and in occupations that required high levels of formal education to a society where now roughly one third of the adult population is, is working those kinds of careers. And, and so that's in, in a sense narrowed the income distribution. Uh, but then on the other hand, uh, for a variety of reasons, the, the, the gaps between people with a bachelor's degree and those with just a high school diploma have increased over the last 40 years. 
And there are a lot of theoretical reasons why economists think that that has occurred, some relating to what they call skilled bias, technological change, that the kinds of technologies available are mm -hmm. more conducive to creating demand for higher educated workers and, and making them disproportionately more productive uh, insofar as they're the ones more directly interacting with the technology and, and using it. In some cases, if you're a computer programmer, not only are you using the technology, but you're helping to create it. And so obviously demand for, for those technologies is going to, to make your skills more lucrative. Uh, but then there are, uh, those are kind of market-based reasons. You could also throw in trade, but there it's it's more uh, in, in some ways, maybe the, the downward demand for for people with a high school diploma, at least in the United States and other rich countries as, as we've shifted trade offshore. Um, but there are also what you could think of as more political economy explanations for, for mm -hmm. these issues that, that, uh, that get to how laws specifically interact with the labor market. And, and some of them uh, are disproportionately bad for lower income workers. And um, that would include uh, arguably uh, large scale immigration of workers with low levels of education who are competing more directly with with workers in the United States with a high school diploma, whereas it's actually very hard to get into this country. If you have a bachelor's degree, you have to qualify in many cases for an H-1 visa, and um, that supply is is very limited. And for certain occupations, it's prohibited. Uh, you have to practice as a lawyer or a, a doctor, for example. You have to have uh, be accredited at a U.S. university, in in, in many cases, and or pass. In exams, these are U.S.-based exams. So some of the the competition is 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 kind of encouraged for lower income workers, but discouraged for higher income workers, and so that's I think contributed to the gap between uh, between incomes. Um, there are other sorts of uh, distortions in the labor market that favor elite professionals that I just spend a lot of time describing in the book. Uh, we can get into later, but uh, going back more directly to higher education. Uh, the other side of it, obviously, is that um, you can expect to receive higher earnings, and we see these. We see this in the data that the Department of Education has put out. Uh, schools that ha are more selective tend to have graduates who earn higher earnings, and and so that and that's also you know, dovetails with the fact that that people with higher levels of literacy, numeracy. Uh, tend to also earn higher, do better in the labor market. Uh, and so you know, whether that is driving income inequality or just a reflection of it is, is kind of complicated to tease out, but certainly, uh, there's, certainly there's an aspect of it where early childhood education through high school and the, the types of skills that, are, that, that the children are learning during those eras are reflected in first of all whether they're admitted into a selective university and then if regardless whether they're admitted whether they're able to qualify to work in a, a skilled occupation that is, is highly rewarded in the labor market can, can I, so it can come both ways because this this is fantastic this is so rich and, and friends you can see why i was so excited to get jonathan on here um let me let me pose a paradox um you know, we know from a lot of macroeconomic historical work that uh, throughout the 20th century, the goal was to, uh, among other things, educate as many people as possible because, among other things, the demands for labor involved more education, especially with changing technology. That's the basis of um, the race between technology and education. I'm blanking on the authors, but you can read the book. Yeah, Golden Cats. That's it. Um, but you're saying now that one of the problems is that that's kind of flipped around now that we are so good in higher education, generating so many graduates with degrees that lead them into these professions, that those professions have now seen their compensation accelerate. So that's actually producing a widening gap between their incomes, their earnings, their wealth, as well as those who don't have that kind of access. I mean, it's, it seems almost like the success of higher education led to an undoing of this mission. Well, I would say that insofar as we increase uh, access to higher education and graduate more people or bring in more immigrants with, with high levels of education, the, both of those in and of themselves will tend to dep 
depress the the wage gap between those with a college degree and those with a high school diploma. But I think what's what's tricky is that all these other things have been happening at the same time that we've been kind of gradually ramping up the supply of, of college educated workers. Uh, and that, and that, that one of them is is this explosion of, of new technologies. One is the urbanization of the economy, right. and the urbanization of, of life, moving away from farms. Uh, and, and we, we continue to see every year more people moving to cities in, in rich countries and in, in poor countries as well. Okay. And that, that creates demand for new types of jobs. If you're if you're uh, a city that ha in, living in a city with a lot of rich professionals, uh, the, they are going to have high levels of demand for childcare workers. They're going to have high levels of demand for restaurant workers, mm -hmm. and those are fairly low-paying jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you'd expect income inequality in the city to 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 not really be resolve itself because you've got this situation where where richer people are are requiring the services of of lower income people uh, uh, and then there's there's a group in the middle which I think a lot of us would like to foster more of uh, which would be kind of skilled technicians mm -hmm. people that don't necessarily have to go all the way to a bachelor's degree level but can still earn a good living in a skilled trade uh, there's those types of jobs still exist some of them have been offshored but certainly in the construction industry they're they're local and they're not going anywhere. There's there's jobs, of course, in, in plumbing and installation maintenance repair that mm -hmm. just about every city needs. And increasingly, there's jobs at lower levels uh, for technicians related to IT and computers, uh, as well as healthcare. Uh, and so those those are promising avenues that could shore up the middle class. And and it's very important that high schools and community colleges uh, play uh, you know important roles in providing high quality educational opportunities so that people can access those in an affordable way. Uh, the, I mean, the other issue that we haven't even talked about yet is the, the growing cost of college. Um, right. Well, I'll, I'll stop there for now. But there's well, yeah. a lot of ways we can take this. We actually have a question directly on that point. So let me just put this on the screen. Uh, so friends, if you're new uh, to the forum, uh, this is a, a classic way to participate. Uh, this is a question from uh, Julie Goodfox, at uh, Indian Nations University, and she asked, after college education, do we know if student loans delay entry into the class or otherwise delay economic earning potential? It's it's a great question. I, I would say the the channel that to me that is most compelling as to how it, it could delay entry onto an upward trajectory is by stopping somebody from getting a loan or for taking the risk of becoming an entrepreneur. Mm. One of the trends that that Mm -hmm. uh, my CEO, Jim Clifton at Gallup, is most worried about, and I'm worried about it too, is, is declining entrepreneurship in the United States. Since 1980, we've seen a pretty dramatic fall in the number of startups and the number of startups per capita and any way you want to really look at it. And it's been across different industries, even though we think of like Silicon Valley and so on as being this uh, just this incubator. Mm -hmm. uh, even, even despite all, all that activity, uh, Fewer and fewer people are starting businesses, and and we think one reason is probably the student loan issue and the fact that when people are graduating, they they are carrying all this debt. Uh, it's it's certainly not the only issue. Probably rising healthcare costs also have something to do with it. Uh, it's uh, you're more likely to want to work for a big employer that's providing you benefits um, than than absorbing the, those those the risk of of not having health insurance or paying for it out of pocket yourself as a sole proprietor or a small business owner. So I think those are some of, of, of the considerations you need to think about. I would say overall student, aside from that channel, student loans probably haven't uh, had a, a tremendously negative effect on, on leading to upward trajectories and in, in income for graduates because you know, you're, you're, you still have the skills hopefully uh, and 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 then you, you need to pay back the loan, so you're incentivized to take a high-paying job. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so then the issue is just what you know. What does that hit to your net worth uh, do to you? It's gonna it's yeah. gonna delay you from buying a house. It's gonna delay you from starting a business. Those are the the channels that I'm most concerned about. In addition to the just the deterrent effect that the high price of college has on on entry and completion in the first place. Yeah, the high sticker price, which is what most people see. Um, Oh, thank you. That's a, that's a great question, uh, 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 Dean Fox. That's a great question. And what a rich answer, Jonathan. Uh, just plug, 
Gallup, do more work on this. Um, but we have uh, two more questions that happen at the same time, and they're almost the same questions. So I'm going to put them both up here. Um, this goes back to one of your earlier points. Uh, Kelly Walsh asks about urbanization. Will COVID-19 uh, push people away? And then Charles Finley asked the same question. Um, is urbanization a trend that will continue past COVID-19 or post COVID-19? Yeah, th those are both... Uh, those are both really good questions, and and certainly population density is 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 a, a really important factor to the spread of of the virus, and uh, you know the spread of pandemics generally. Um, I do think, however, that you know once, especially once there's a vaccine, we I think we I think the hope that we all have hearing from Francis Collins at the NIH and Dr. Fauci is that we will have a vaccine in about a year, year and a half. It seems to me that that really will be a, a tremendous change in, in terms of how people uh, are, are confronting this. And, and it, it maybe now there will be some reluctance to, to move to a big city over, the, over that period. And people who are thinking of, of moving to big cities may, may not. Or, uh, I, I, but I don't think that this fundamentally changes the reasons why people want to live in big cities. The, the advantages are, are huge. Um, essentially allows you to trade with people in a way that is very difficult in rural areas. Now, the fact that so many things through through Zoom calls, through shindig and, and these sorts of technologies have in many ways made it easier to participate in the economy, uh, especially in you know, professional roles um, remotely. And, and, and that certainly has taken some of the advantage of being in, in, a, in, a, in a dense urban area. Uh, but the the urban economics literature, which focuses on that, has generally found that it, it's it, it's not enough to to override the the advantages at this point. Now, whether you know, technologies get even better in the next ten years or so, and that starts to go the other way, is has yet to be seen. Obviously, uh, but I I suspect that yeah this this very long historical trend of 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 moving towards cities of the increased professionalization of the economy uh, will continue and uh, you know a lot of those advantages that we see from being able to network locally uh, being able to connect to people locally will will continue well those are great questions gentlemen and uh, that's a very very rich answer let's hope we get a vaccine sooner rather than later um, Along these lines, we have a, a question going back to one of your earlier points, uh, which has to do with um, the exclusivity of higher education versus open access. And I want to welcome uh, Mark Rush from Washington Lee University. Hello, Mark. Hey there. Can you hear me okay? Perfectly. Oh, good. Good to be here. First time. Welcome to board. <laughs> no, what, what the, oops, did I lose you? Nope. Can you still see us? Yeah, I just lost sight of me. Now, the question I wanted to ask, Jonathan, and, and thanks, Brian, for pulling me up, is, you know, we're, we're really looking at sort of a, a system-wide issue of, you know, economic inequality and so forth and then access to higher education. It seems to me that um, the real challenge we face isn't so much one of wanting to get to higher ed as it is one of the hurdles that the higher ed sector seems to build towards access. We celebrate exclusivity more instead of, more than access to higher ed. So that's you know, an observation. I'm wondering how higher ed then as a sector might be able to restructure itself to address that. It can't solve all of society's problems of inequality, but it can help. And you know, can you identify, is there maybe an American state or another country that seems to be doing this? And it's gonna be a slow, small impact, but perhaps, you know, there's a model that could work that wouldn't scare people. What do you know? Yeah, uh, yeah, great question. So there are, yeah, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of ways I could take that. One, one thought is that in some of the work that I've done, uh, both when, seven years ago, I was at, not even seven years ago, well, about six years ago, I was at the Brookings Institution, mm -hmm. and, and more recently at Gallup was to try to think of ways to to highlight colleges that are spe specifically succeeding for lower income workers or for or, or, I mean, lower income students or for students who are not scoring you know, near the top of the SAT distribution. And so one way of, of doing that that I developed was at Brookings was to, to try to look at what I, what I called value added measures of, of uh, 
yeah, you know, value measured outcomes. So in that case, so a simple exercise took earnings data from the college, uh, from the Department of Education college scorecard, and looked at how the the characteristics of students predict those those earnings. So of course, students that come in with higher SAT scores and ACT scores are, are earning higher on average. Uh, but once you adjust for those things, you adjust for the uh, the income of of students. Uh, there's there's this unexplained variation in earnings, and uh, some schools are much more consistently better at generating students with higher earnings, given the characteristics of the student body, than others. And one of the the findings there is that, the, which won't surprise many of you, is that the the schools that were more focused on STEM skills tended to, to consistently do better. So one in Indiana, Rose Holman, uh, graduates almost exclusively students in computer science and engineering, and they, they tend to get very high paying jobs right after, right after college. So of course, there's more to life than just earnings. And I'm sure many of you are tired of the STEM versus liberal arts debate, so I won't, I won't get into that. But there are other ways to, um, you know, to, to, to look at this, one is by you know, something that we did with, with uh, Strata and, and, and some Gallup polling work that we've done, is to ask, ask alumni whether they would recommend their school to other people and, and, and questions along those lines that get to the subjective quality of the, the educational experience. And that was less tied to your actual skills and, your, and the income you're earning, although they were related. Uh, but uh, it, it gets at some of those other intangible factors that matter to somebody's career, and whether they feel like they're you know, applying their skills in a useful way. Um, but then it, all, but it also highlights the fact that a lot, that there are schools out there that are kind of hidden gems that are doing very well that aren't the top of the U.S. News and World Report rankings, but that are generating consistently good experience for students. So that's that's one way to try to just try to move away from selectivity and exclusivity, as you say, rightly, as, as kind of the benchmarks of success. I think what we should care a lot more about is the, the quality of the experiences that the students are having. Uh, and then as they reflect back uh, from the experience as an alumni who's now out in the labor market, do they feel like their education was worthwhile and helpful to them? And the extent to the, which they do seems seems to really predictive of, of other things that we care about, like their overall evaluation of their life and that, that sort of thing. So that's that's one approach, and then uh, yeah, the other things going to like more of a policy perspective mm. that that strike me as important is is emphasizing in high school uh, access to gaining specific technical skills that are going to be useful in the labor market. Some uh, I think there's been a lot of emphasis on trying to get students to take AP classes so they're kind of college ready and they can make some uh, in, inroads there, maybe not maybe not have to pay for an extra class or two. But in, in addition to that track, which is perfectly worthwhile, I, I'm very, I, I find uh, this sort of program that's available in Virginia Beach, for example, where they've got a, uh, a very high quality community college that works with the high school. And anybody can take classes that almost inevitably result in a formal certification at the community college during their junior or senior year of high school. And then they, they could, if they wanted to, immediately get a, a decent job or, which I think a more promising option, is that they take the specific technical knowledge that they have and then they go get a bachelor's degree or an associate's degree. Uh, hopefully, uh, in the, they're not spending a fortune doing so, but they, they are bringing with them skills that are, are quite valuable, that they can build upon. And, and maybe combine with a liberal arts education, maybe combine with a STEM education or something else along those lines. Uh, but, but just being, uh, you know, recognizing that, that high schools, which are already free and, and public, uh, can, be, can do a better job of, pre of preparing young students to, 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 to both be more successful at college, but also be more successful in the labor market. Well. Mark, thank you for that great, and and Jonathan, that was a small book what you just said. Um, that was a very very good book. thank you, uh, friends. If if you're new to the forum, uh, this is the way. It's that easy to bring someone up on video to uh, to talk, uh, and it's always good to see somebody's face and see the space where they are and, and to hear their voice. Um, we have more questions just coming in. Um, like Matt, uh, I want to flash up one from uh, Matthew Cohen. 
uh, from Cohen Strategy Group. And he brings up not a question which is observation. For students to be successful, they need guidance that supports all dimensions of their well-being. Too often, the biggest barriers to academic success have very little academics. Matthew, if you want to, if you want to follow up with that, either just type in another comment or click the raised hand. We'd love to follow that. Um, based on that, if you could respond to that, Jonathan. Well, we do see evidence of that and and some of the consulting. Well, one thing we do at GAV is we do some consulting in higher education, and uh, we've been working with with some colleges and in, in trying to shore up their the retention, and uh, especially of of online students and in graduate programs, which is of course a great money maker for a lot of schools now. They can charge kind of full rates, and if it's online, the costs aren't quite as uh, it's not quite as expensive to provide those services. Uh, but the retention rates are often lower, and so uh, mm. you know, what are so we're trying to unpack what's behind that. And you know, grades and GPA are one thing, but but uh, to Matthew's point, there, there's more than that. So one thing that we've identified is that students who are juggling work responsibilities, childcare responsibilities, uh, th those sorts of things are are much less likely to to, to finish the program. And then that so that raises the issue. Well, what is there anything that the school can do uh, to to be to be more helpful and more to provide more greater flexibility uh, to 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 to, to kind of work with the students in some way, whether it's through kind of guidance counseling or yeah. or in, in any other way to that you know, to to help you know, students who are in those positions and are really juggling some some serious. Uh, challenges to, to to navigate those more successfully. Well, that, that's a good answer, Matthew. Welcome. Uh, would you like to uh, continue on that? Yeah. Hi. How are you guys? And Brian, just a um, quick note of thanks for you to continuing to keep the community engaged and connected through this time. I appreciate your hosting these and continuing to do these. And I know that uh, other folks share my appreciation. So I just wanted to to say that. Um, but thank you. Yes. Yeah, so trends which have been uh, already occurring, it seems to have been accelerated by this pandemic, particularly around some of the inequities in and around higher education. The need has really only increased and intens intensified uh, for, for high quality education. The um, campus-based resources that were previously offered to help scaffold and support students must also migrate online. So what I'm wondering is how can we accelerate progress moving forward, especially for our most vulnerable communities, particularly the ones that you just identified that are um, encountering food and housing insecurity, transportation issues, uh, Wi-Fi connectivity issues, and others. I'll, 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 I'll suspend there. Yeah, I mean those are those are tough challenges. Uh, some of them, uh, unfortunately, probably beyond the scope of what the university can afford to to deal with. Uh, but then there there may be others where you know that you can think of, of of kind of creative solutions. One could be even kind of trying to build community among online students, uh, give them opportunities to to have you know virtual gatherings uh, outside of scheduled hours. Uh, where they can exchange, uh, you know, notes and, and help each other out academically. At least, you know, if, you know, if you've got some of the the better students in the class helping some of the students who are struggling with material, you know, that could th those relationships and then also the you know the the, the, the literal help that they're offering could be uh, you know, enough to kind of tip the scales in some cases to keep people engaged. Uh, but yeah, it's going to be hard for 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 colleges given the. the the huge level of cost that they're already dealing with and the kinds of programs they're dealing with uh, to, to really ramp up services, I think. Um, but, you know, some that they're already providing that could be moved online that occur to me would be things like guidance counseling and, and, uh, and, and even kind of medical and psychiatric services where uh, one positive outcome of, of this pandemic is that the telemedicine trends have accelerated and uh, more hospitals, insurance companies, that sort of thing are are moving forward with offering those kinds of, of, of services and, and, and funding them. So that's maybe one area where I could see services that are typically only campus-based could, could migrate successfully to online. 
Thank you. I, I think that you're absolutely right that, that college is a great route out of poverty, but in order for that path to work, students must escape the conditions of poverty long enough to complete that degree. And I, uh, I hope that colleges during this time will continue to step up. Me too. Thanks very much for those comments and questions. Thank you. Uh, we have we have more questions and comments just just flooding in. Uh, Jonathan, you really tapped a, a very very rich vein. Um, we have one looking ahead a little bit, uh, and this is from uh, uh, Sarah, whose name I always try not to massacre, uh, San Gregorio. Who asks, She's been reading about students taking a gap year. How do you think that's likely to affect student loan impairment, shift to trades, and enrollment in general? Yeah, it's 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 a really interesting question. I I mean I, I wouldn't I don't have a strong view about encouraging it or discouraging it. Uh, I think some of it will you know be kind of a case by case basis. The I think the, the positive aspect of it that I see is that one you know it, it it helps maybe resolve one concern is that where students are are going in too early without really knowing what they want to study without having a clear major pathway in front of them. And so if they do take that gap year, uh, that could that could help clarify that role. So they're gonna waste fewer resources and, and, and time on, on classes that aren't relevant to ultimately the major that they wanna pick. The other thing that I think is really important is, is, is just learn, there's just the practical skills that they can learn by entering the labor force. You know, if, if they're only jobs up until that point where summer jobs or maybe no work at all, then uh, those early experiences, even if it's a uh, you know, one year internship or you know, some kind of low paid occupation, uh, if it's hopefully it's, it's at least in a field that they feel like is relevant to them in, in the long run and they're, they're acquiring some skills. Um, it, it's amazing, I think, you know, even, how, even using Microsoft Office products if you're working in, at the lowest level in a professional office, you know, it can, can really make a difference and can make it easier to then finish your degree once you end up enrolling. Uh, so I think those are, and the other thing it does is, is it potentially clarifies, in, in clarifying the track that you wanna take, it can shorten the course. So you may realize that you wanna be a registered nurse and before you and you you realize that by doing some some getting working at a, at a fairly low paying job as a health aide that requires you know, maybe just a certification or no no credentials at all and then you and then you pursue a associate's degree and and before having that experience you may have thought that you needed to get a bachelor's degree uh, and so there I do think there could be some efficiency gains of of kind of testing out uh, some of the, you know, the labor market to some extent. Uh, although I got to say that was not my experience was to go straight through and, and, and just get it over with and, and accumulate as many degrees as possible and enter the labor market. So I think it really will depend on on the individual. Ultimately, yes, uh, that's always the peril of macro analysis that it comes back to um, what individuals <clears throat> would do and see. Um, we have a, a series of questions from uh, that are wonderful that all came in from the Sergio Costa, who's at uh, CUNY School of Public Health. And um, let me just read one of these, um, which is, uh, how can higher education become more sophisticated in detecting on-demand skills that can inform certificates and programs? There are lots of emerging alternative educational providers who would not produce well-rounded students. Higher ed should meet those needs. I think that's a really great question and one that I, I have I had a chance to, to think about and work on. So I, I think the observation is, is dead on that uh, places like the University of Phoenix, Kaplan, the, the for-profit online schools have been very adept, I think it's fair to say, at figuring out exactly what employers are looking for and then at least advertising that that's what they're offering students. Now, I think the reality when you look at the outcomes is that in many cases, the students are struggling to, to, to get what was advertised to them with those degrees. And at least that's the evidence uh, from, from a variety of sources I've looked at. And then, so the question is, is what, what could uh, traditional colleges and places like CUNY you learn from, from what those more flexible for-profit schools are doing? So I think there are some ways. Um, 
there are uh, you know, companies that do do things like provide web scraping uh, of of job vacancy advertisements and and code them for uh, specific skills that employers are looking for. So some ex some kind of research exercises that I've done and that has bled over to consulting work in higher education is to hmm. is to, is to try to give schools a sense of which skills are most in demand in their metropolitan area and then which what employers are providing those skills so a company like burning glass is one of, one of these that does this kind of web scraping that you could do this sort of analysis with and if you do it it's not like you have to do it every uh, month or anything like that if you do it you know, every a few years or so it's probably enough to um to keep up with you know just sense of uh, you know how which what kind of programming languages are in demand, what kind of software are employers looking for in job vacancy ads, and 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 then you also get a sense of kind of the range of uh, yeah, uh, yeah, certifications that uh, are common, and, 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 and not all of those are going to be directly transferable to the curriculum that you have. There may, you, presidents or the deans may want to shift around some resources a little bit to accommodate that, but Sure. But I think it also could just be, uh, you know, professors who see that this new software package is is more in demand than the one that they had when they were in school. Maybe just, you know, take some time to learn the new one and and then incorporate that in the classroom, and that could be even enough to kind of give a leg up to the students, especially if it's like a programming language or something that is is going to be directly relevant to a potential job. Uh, Sergio, that was a great question. Uh, Jonathan, that's a very, very uh, powerful answer. Uh, we have a, um, a reminder from uh, uh, Catherine, uh, who asked us to uh, remind us that uh, the majority of students are not traditional age and we're not full-time residential even before COVID. So thank you. And it's really important to uh, um, keep that uh, demographic reality in mind. Thank you. Um, I'd like to bring, we've been talking about the market a bit, and I'd like to bring uh, up uh, a previous guest uh, on the program, um, who is a uh, uh, not only a fantastic commentator, um, but also a uh, very, very deep thinker in um, higher education. Uh, this is Stephen Downs uh, coming to you from uh, Canada, and let me see if we can add him to talk about the market and how we might change market conditions, perhaps. Hello, fellow UFCW alumna. So, hello, um, and uh, thanks for having me up, long-time listener for, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, I want to reframe things ever so slightly uh, because I think we're talking about different things when we talk about inequality and uh, you know, being polite, I think the inequality that you're raising is a bit of a straw man. So I have a prop. Uh, I'm not sure how well that comes across. Very well. Okay. So you get the idea, right? The inequality that you've been talking about is the inequality between, say, maybe the top 5 or 10% and the rest. That would be uh, the inequality between professionals and non-professionals. And that's what's come up a lot. But the real structural inequality and arguably the cause for all the rest of our problems, arguably, is the massive gains being made by the top one percent and uh you know it's not on this chart because it, but also the gains being made in corporate wealth concentration of corporate wealth and the rest and the reason why that's important is because the common discourse is that uh university uh helps people move out of poverty and address the inequality gap by addressing things like skills and competencies, education, somebody mentioned entrepreneurship, etc. Uh, arguably, first of all, none of this will help. And secondly, as has, has been hinted at, um, the benefits of a university education 
uh, for people of lower classes coming into university are notably much less than the benefits that rich people get. Rich people don't even have to finish and they can still found, you know, uh, multi-billion dollar companies. Uh, poor people have to finish, pay off their loans, um, and maybe, maybe they'll break even. So, you know, I could put this in the form of a question. Uh, has Gallup actually looked at, you know, how well poor people do in universities? But more to the point, have we established statistically a relation not between university attendance and lower income, but between increased skills and lower income? Because from my observation, and we made a bunch of pro-union comments in the chat thread, uh, the, the issue is has nothing to do with skills, except that the payment or return on skills has been declining steadily over, over the years. And the return on having wealth, being in the financial industry, et cetera, being part of the ownership class has been increasing. And how can or would possibly uh, universities or the education system in general change that? Well, I, I love this comment, and uh, it's you're really getting into the heart of the book now. To be, honestly, uh, there's there's some I have some discussion about higher education in the book, but a lot gets at so a lot of the issues that you're talking about. And I, first of all, I agree entirely that most of the action in terms of income inequality in the United States and, and other rich countries is, is the gap between the one percent and and others, and that does raise the obvious point that not everybody who goes to college makes it to the one percent um hmm. and, and so it can't be college alone that explains it and so i, I go through the, the first chapter of the book honestly uh debunks a, a lot of the existing theories about why income inequality in the united states has has increased and what one of the ones that i spend the most time debunking throughout the book is is, is the one that it's about skills and uh, i had a piece in the new york times upshot uh, where I, I, I presented a thought exercise that's in the book. And the thought exercise goes like this. What if we paid everybody based on their observable skills? So the, how they score on IQ tests and also how they score on personality tests, because we know that that's a, that's a non-cognitive skill is what it's called, that is also valuable in the labor market and valuable you know, kind of intuitively if somebody's conscientious, they're showing up for work, they're doing their work on schedule and that kind of thing, their employer's gonna be happier. Um, so if you if you paid somebody based on those things and, and also you know, made any kind of other adjustments that you want, uh, what you'd see is uh, the in income distribution wouldn't go up, it would fall by half. So, it's, that's, so that suggests that we're overpaying um, people in the 1%. Uh, and, and in fact, I have direct evidence in the book that people in 1% really aren't scoring any higher on those kinds of IQ tests than, mm -hmm. than the, the rest of us. Um, and you don't get there because you're a genius. You get there, uh, I, I, I spent a lot of time saying who gets there and why. And uh, my estimations are that about half of the people that make it to the 1% are in industries or occupations that can have special privileges in the economy. And so uh, you mentioned finance. That's a that's one that will be obvious to a lot of people. Uh, and, and within finance, people in the hedge fund industry, in particular, enjoy very high gains. Famously, two and twenty is the rule of compensation, where you get you get twenty percent of the earnings of of your customers. I think that's a great deal. Uh, if you're a hedge fund manager, I think it's a terrible deal. If you're a union worker who's pension fund is invested in hedge funds and the largest investors in hedge funds are union pension funds and so they're basically stealing from workers and giving them to rich people who live in connecticut um that's my perspective on it anyway uh, and then disagreeing. Uh, yeah i didn't think you would uh and then the other sort of disproportionate groups of people who are in the one percent would include highly regulated occupations doctors are the number one group about uh 20% of people in the 1%, uh, maybe 15, let's say 15, are, uh, are doctors, uh, another 7% are lawyers. And what's special about these groups is that, first of all, you can't, you can't practice unless you jump through a whole bunch of hurdles. And that obviously involves more than just getting a bachelor's degree, it involves a very expensive pathway through the education system. Um, 
And then the other thing that's that's special about these groups is that you can't provide their services or even you can't compete with them, um, even if you're qualified to do so, unless you uh, overcome their lobbying efforts. So nurse practitioners have been deemed uh, qualified to provide family and general practice medicine by the National Academy of Science and by a number of states. But in the largest states in the country, it's illegal for a nurse practitioner to practice independently. He or she has to work under a doctor and share uh, the profits uh, with, with the doctor in the doctor's office. Um, and likewise for dental hygienists, likewise for uh, uh, legal technicians. So Washington State recently created a, a, a licensed legal technician role that didn't exist before because there's a shortage of people that were available to provide family counseling services to couples who are going through divorce, child custody disputes, and all, all sorts of family legal issues that arise for low-income families that can't afford a lawyer. Uh, so this, the state Supreme Court ruled that these licensed technicians could provide counsel that they could not represent them in court. It was violently opposed by the Bar Association of the state of Washington, and it's been uh, resisted very strongly by the National Bar Association, so it hasn't spread to any other state. Uh, and so those are examples of, of people that could provide the same services for half the cost with much less education. Uh, people who receive the services from those people are happy, but uh, all the money's going to the 1% because they've rigged the market to their- Well, uh, you remember you're speaking to someone from Canada, right? Uh, and, uh, our legal and medical uh, environment is very different um, and, and we don't have many of the same issues as exist in the United States. Uh, we have a public health care system, uh, which not only insures all of us, uh, it also costs on average half as much as the U.S. system, which suggests to me that uh, a big part of the problem is structural uh, as opposed to, you know, uh, related to competition. Um, and And this gets to one of the criticisms of universities that I've often made, and I'll just leave this with a, a parting question comment. Uh, and to what degree are universities involved in entrenching and maintaining that structural inequality, both, you know, the structural inequality we see for compensation, uh, you know, in, but also the structural inequality that preserves the privilege of the 1%. We see institutes like Harvard and Yale and the rest who are basically in the business of making sure, from my perspective, that the wealthy stay wealthy. And that's similarly the function of the healthcare system, the legal system, and so on. Uh, structurally, they preserve the wealth of the rich. So what role do universities play in preserving this inequality and what could they do to change to begin to think about actually producing greater equity in society and i argue they would have to change substantially well for me the thing that i would change the most i think is absolutely critical for universities to change is to make themselves far more efficient than they already are than they are mm -hmm. uh and, and by that i mean providing uh, services at a much lower cost, whether it's whether that cost is borne by state governments, the federal government, or or by parents and students uh, through student loans, uh, is 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 kind of a, to me a secondary issue. Uh, I think there's very good evidence that, as with healthcare, uh, we as Americans are overpaying um, for for higher education, and oh, yeah. and, and like. Like with healthcare, you can compare uh, the costs uh, per student or per capita um, to other countries and see that they're getting very nice outcomes. And when you look at adult literacy and numeracy scores, the United States ranks very poorly compared to uh, countries around the world. Um, and so that doesn't speak well to the the overall structure of our education system, K through 12 through higher ed. Um, and it is a problem if, if, our, if our universities are just going to become bastions of the world's elite students and just cater to them and, uh, and not bring up 
students from uh, diverse backgrounds and offer services that are affordable and relevant to them, then I think that's a really serious problem. I do think, fortunately, the good news, I'm maybe not as pessimistic as you are about, about universities in terms of their willingness to, to become you know, funnels for upward mobility and uh, to tr try to reach those students. Uh, I do think, first of all, they, they, yeah, they, ne they need to they need to lower prices, and if that means cutting costs, so be it. But they also need to, um, yeah, think about uh, well, you know, some of the issues that we just discussed in terms of are, is there is their endowment serving? Who's their endowment serving? Is is it? Uh, it's it is kind of obnoxious to me that you know, billions of dollars in alumni donations and former student tuition is going to hedge funds and and elite bankers and not going to current students who need tuition reductions. Um, I think that's one thing. Uh, the other is, yeah, I think it was harder for universities to control. I think we need a new healthcare system and, you know, university leaders ideally would be on the front lines of helping think through what a, a better healthcare system that's far more efficient than the current one we have in the United States would look like and more equitable. Um, but I think that's that's really beyond their control. Um, you know, certainly if they're influential in the American Medical Association, American Bar Association, I think there's opportunities to reform in, in those in those cases, uh, which are you know things that I'd encourage them to do. But I'll, I'll stop there. I mean, those. I, John, John, Jonathan, Stephen, I, I I have to stop you there because yeah. <laughs> not only have we reached a fantastic point. But we've also just shot past the end of the hour, and and I want to respect everyone's time. Stephen, thank you so much, uh, as always, for, for joining us. And uh, Jonathan, thank you for such fantastic answer. I really appreciate uh, where you just took us in the last 15 minutes. Um, I, I'm conscious of time, so I've got to ask a, a closing question. What's the best way for people to keep up with you and your work? Well, I almost always post uh, my latest research on Twitter, uh, which is not everybody's favorite platform. Uh, and I have mixed feelings about it myself. But if you want, to, if you want to see my latest work, you can look yeah. at my Twitter feed at JT Rothwell. JT Rothwell, very good, very good. Um, and if we need to uh, uh, get a copy of your book, we have a link to it down there on the on the bottom left corner of the screen. Uh, John, thank you so much. We're going to have to bring you back just because this is so rich and so fantastic. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity and a really great discussion with, with your guests here. Uh, so it was a lot of fun.